Hey guys, welcome back to Afternoon Read. I'm Miss Linda and we are going to continue reading Dark Lord by Jamie Thompson. We are going to be reading part, uh, chapter two of part one. So let's get started. He woke to find himself in a bed, inside a small square room. He looked down at himself. He was still in the body of a human child. It hadn't been a dream then. It was real. There was a large window on one side of the room, with a view over the city. It was even bigger than he'd imagined when he was in the chariot of ambulance. So much glass, and steel, and stone. The sight actually awed him for a moment. He was going to need a horde of orcs to conquer it all. A big horde. He realized he was feeling a little better. He was able to sit up in bed. Next to him, on a tray that he could swing over his lap, was a meal of what looked like bread placed on either side of some kind of meat, and a selection of odd-looking fruit. He was hungry, so he devoured it all without thinking, though it wasn't something he'd usually eat. When he'd finished, he tried to get up. He managed a few steps towards what looked like a hot water basin. Or rather, just a water basin. I put hot in there. I don't know why. And then he saw it. The mirror. He looked into it and saw the face of a brown-haired, unremarkable, somewhat tubby human child of about 12 years of age. He couldn't bear the sight. Where were his majestic horns, great canine fangs, and bony skull ridges? Where was the mottled skin like a thousand-year-old parchment stretched across the warped and twisted skull of one who had mastered death millennia ago? No taloned skeletal hands, no black robes and bone-encrusted helms, none of the accoutrements of an evil one. It was too much to bear. No, he cried, and he drove his fist into the mirror. The mirror cracked, but did not shatter. And suddenly, Dirk felt pain in his hand. He wasn't used to that. He looked down. There was no blood, luckily. But it was the shock of realizing how pitifully weak he was that really upset him. Human children were puny. He looked up. The cracked mirror distorted his features in a rather pleasing way. Discordant, disturbed, and twisted. That was better. The door swung open, and several adult humans entered the room. One of them, a youngish female of the species, said, Hello, Dirk. But before she got any further, he interrupted, saying, Dark. It's dark look. Oh, what's the use? And he fell silent. The humans exchanged told you so looks, and the woman continued, I'm Miss Chloe from Social Services. And these gentlemen are Dr. Wings and Professor Randall, specialists from the Child Psychology Unit. We're here to make an assessment. Dirk scowled. Err. Social services? Could that be some kind of legion or military service unit for cleaning out social undesirables, like humans and elves and other pointless do-gooders? And a unit of psycho-specialists. That sounded useful. Why hadn't he thought of that? A legion of insane, psychotic, berserk orcs, for instance. What a thought. There was much to be learned here, assuming he survived this next encounter with humankind. Don't worry. We're here to help, said Wings. Of course you are, said Dirk. Now listen, puny humans. First, 
you will tell me where I am. Then you shall bring me some clothes and my cloak, and then take me to your leader. I will accept his sworn statement of fealty immediately, and take a man of the city forthwith. If you disobey me, I will destroy you all. They stared at him, dumbfounded for a moment. Wings actually giggled, until Randall glared at him and he felt silent. Dirk took this to mean that they were finally beginning to recognize the deference and respect owed to him. Or maybe not. You're in a hospital, Dirk, said Miss Cloy, and they'll be keeping you overnight for observation. Nobody can find anything physically wrong with you, but something must have, um, happened to you. And that's what we'd like to find out, so we can help you, said Randall. I warn you, said Dirk, and he raised his hands, calling forth all the power invested in his great ring, intent on engulfing them in torment with a spell of agonizing obedience. Normally, he just killed them outright, but he needed some slaves to do his bidding, and the quickest way to crush them into complete submission was by the use of extreme pain. But nothing happened. His ring of power was still dull and lifeless. He ran through several spells in his mind. Spells of empowerment, spells of transmutation, of death, domination, and destruction. But nothing worked. He really had lost his powers. A wave of nausea and despair washed over him. Weakly, he climbed back onto the bed. Dr. Wings noticed the broken mirror and said, Look, Randall. He smashed the mirror. Hmm. Interesting, said Randall, stroking his chin ruminatively. That's a hard word. Who are these idiots? Dirk thought to himself. Miss Cloy sat on the end of his bed. Wings and Randall pulled up chairs. Wings popped what looked like some kind of brightly colored pill into his mouth. Dirk's brow furrowed at that. Was that some kind of magic pill that would enhance his strength or give him protection against the powers of darkness? Noting Dirk's interest, Wings pulled out a package of these odd pills and offered them to Dirk. Chewing gum? He said innocently. Ha! You're drunk. You won't drug me so easily, you foolish human, Dirk replied, waving the chewing gum away dismissively. Wings and Randall exchanged an enigmatic look. Perhaps they were beginning to realize who they were dealing with, thought Dirk. What followed was several hours of what Dirk called his interrogation. It was long and drawn out because they were too weak-minded and squeamish to use torture. Well, that was their problem. They asked him seemingly useless questions. Who were his parents? What had happened to him? Where did he go to school? And so on. He told them he was from another world, and tried to prove it, but they just wouldn't believe him. Nothing he tried convinced them. They ran what they called tests. They said his intelligence was exceptionally high. Well, of course it was. They also said he trailed behind in other areas, such as empathy, socialization, and morality. Well, of course he did. What did they expect? Such things were useless to a dark lord. Then they asked him to write down exactly what happened to him just before he was found in the safe mark parking lot, which was, in fact, another one of their stores, rather than the citadel of a local warlord, as he had first thought. This is what he wrote, using one of their remarkable pens. 
so much more effective than the old quills back home. He told the tale of the last thing he remembered before his fall to earth. Gargan had unleashed the new war catapults I designed, and that so many orcs had worked on and died building. Their tapped cords made the ground shake, and the skies darkened with roiling, smoke-trailing, spark-splashing balls of blue fire. I watched the faces of the elite knights, the white shields, too closely packed to turn their horses before the barrage rained upon them. Under the steel visors, those grim-set mouths went slack. They knew that death was flying to consume them. Ah, such a glorious day. It was all going so well. I see the battlefield as in a mist. A blood-red mist. We were beating them back. Those impudent fools who had marched to the very heart of my kingdom. There. In the shadow of Mount Dread. In the wan light cast by the dark moon of sorrows. They saw the powers in my command, and their hearts were icy with fear. And then I caught sight of that meddler, the white wizard, Hasdrubin the Pure. Across a sea of battling troops, our eyes locked. I began the incantation of the Ninth Demise. I saw that he held something. A crystal. It shone with power. I had spoken the sixth of the nine symbols that would crack his old veins and spill his blood like dust upon the wind. Hastruben said one word. The crystal blazed with light. And I was falling. After they read this, Wing said to Randall that he noticed something significant. The white shields. Ugh, the elite knights of Hastruben appear, yes, what of them? Said Dirk. Do you know the name of the town we're in, Dirk? Asked this boy. Town? If this was a town, what must their cities be like? Thought Dirk. Works weren't going to be enough to conquer this land. No matter how many he bred. He needed to enslave or persuade some humans to serve him as well, or he'd have no chance. It's called White Shields, said Randall. And I work for the White Shields District, said Miss Cloy. The blood drained from Dirk's face. This was serious. He was a prisoner of the White Shields, his most dedicated enemies. An order of hereditary paladins sworn to one thing, one thing only. His utter destruction. For millennia, they had striven against him, thwarting many of his plans and stratagems, until at last they had achieved this, their final victory. And this Miss Cloy, seemingly harmless, was in fact part of the high district of the White Shields. She just admitted it freely. And this social services legion must be a super elite crack unit in the service of his enemy. Why were they telling him this? Could it be that they knew his powers were so weak they had no fear of him at all? If so, they were right. What could he do against them? All he had at hand were the powers of a twelve-year-old human boy. Still, he must not despair. Despair was for lesser creatures, not for the Lord of Darkness. He would never give up. What he couldn't understand was why they hadn't just killed him outright, or put him on trial, as the white wizard before Hasdrubin had tried to do, up until he'd thrown the meddling old fool into a vat of superheated lava 
that is. Eventually, Chloe, Wings, and Randall were through with him. Dirk was exhausted. As they left, Miss Chloe said something about how they'd be finding him a home to go to, and that he'd be back in school in no time. His heart sank. A home. Surely she could mean a home complete with parents and all that. What a ghastly thought. And he held on to that thought as he fell into a deep sleep. Mrs. Fenton set off in her car to go shopping, as she did nearly every day. Today, the parking lot was full, except for a single space. The same space that no one had parked in for days and days. The one with the strange little black oil slick that wouldn't go away, even when it rained. The one where they'd found that boy with amnesia. She reversed into the space that the car next to hers had parked rather badly, making it really hard for her to get out. And for some reason, that made her mad. Really mad. So she slammed her door open, denting the other car, before stomping off to do her shopping in an angry rage. Which was unusual, for Mrs. Fenton was one of the nicest, most placid people you were ever to likely meet. So that is it for chapter two of part one of Darkmoor. And next week we will continue on with chapter three, part one. And just a reminder, we are reading all of this with the permission of Scholastic. Should have said that in the beginning, but I'm saying it now. All right, guys. See you next Wednesday.